And according to the New York Times, the coronavirus pandemic has changed the way we consume the Internet. A uh, Times analysis shows Americans are using the Internet more to connect and entertain themselves. We are moving our lives online. We're remembering that staring down at this little screen is perhaps uh, not, not that pleasant. And I think what it meant to be real before the Internet is different from what it means to be real now. I think the Internet has fundamentally changed what it means to be human. I'm Chris Stedman, author of IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning, and Belonging in Our Digital Lives. IRL, for, the, for those who aren't clear, uh, means in real life. Um, and it is used often as this kind of contrast between what happens online, which is not real life, and what happens offline, which is real life. And so people use IRL to refer to the non-digital pieces of their lives. This didn't start out as a book about the internet, honestly. It really started with me being sort of haunted by this specific question. What, what, what does it mean to be real? Certainly this year, I mean, I think, you know, in, in the year of the, of the pandemic, you know, some, our lives have changed really suddenly, and much of our lives have moved online. And I think it, it brings us back to these really fundamental questions of, you know, how do I understand who I am? What parts of me are for the benefit of others, um, what parts of me are sort of real expressions of who I feel I am. Again, I think the internet gives us this really unprecedented opportunity in a lot of ways to, to go back to some of those questions. The internet was a formative part of how I came to understand myself in adolescence. Um, the very first people I came out to as queer were on the internet. I have this really vivid memory of biking to the library and going onto one of the computers and kind of crouching over the computer so that nobody could see what I was doing, like kind of, you know, shielding the screen with my body and typing the word gay into the internet for the first time and, and just being um, amazed by how much was out there. Uh, you know, I felt like the only one. I felt completely alone in that experience. I didn't see any other LGBT people around me. I didn't know anyone. Um, the media representations I saw were very few and far between and not at all relatable to my life. And, and yet through the internet I was able to find a community. I was able to find people I could connect with. You know, we're currently in the middle of a, a a large cultural shift um, where people are moving out of the the institutions where they've traditionally made sense of their lives and forged meaningful connections uh, churches other civic organizations um, and they're moving that work the work of being human of making connections with others of exploring big questions and reflecting on the events of their lives, they're moving that work into sort of digital space. For the last few years, I've been working with sociologists to kind of study this phenomenon. The reason why, or a reason why, a lot of people are leaving religious institutions is because now they have this sort of digital space where they can um, learn more about the world around them, connect with other people, um, reflect on their lives, share their lives with others. But what happens when you go through that kind of a large shift is that there, there's loss, right? Um, I've certainly felt that as someone who has left a religious tradition and kind of gone on a more individual journey um, in trying to understand myself and the world around me and connect with others. There's loss to be sure, but there's also, um, there's gain. You know, you have a new opportunity to look at these kind of age old questions in new ways. Yeah, I'm, I'm an atheist, but I went to a Lutheran college and studied religion, and um, I'm actually back at that college now teaching religion, which is so unexpected. <laughs> um, and my advisor um, is a Bonhoeffer scholar, so she studies the work, uh, works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, he was a Lutheran theologian who um, argued that Christians should live as if there isn't a God. And what he meant by that was he 
believed that Christians should not sort of offload the responsibility for building a more just world to uh, a divine entity, but rather should act, should work to discern God's will and then sort of act as God's agents in the world. Um, and I thought about that a lot as I was working on this book because I think that we often live as if the internet isn't real. Um, and that influences the ways in which we show up online and also what we allow the internet to provide for us. Um, if we sort of treat the internet as this fake or less real space, then not only will we sort of show up in a fake or less real way online, but also we won't expect more of it. Whatever you think of the internet, real, not real, somewhere in between, we should aspire to bring the values and practices that we try to bring in every other part of our lives to digital space rather than seeing it as somehow less real. So I think, I think the internet as it exists right now does not make us better. Um, and I think there are two reasons for that. One, a lot of what I've been talking about, this idea that we treat the internet um, as if it's not real, and thus we don't sort of strive to bring the same kind of self-reflective thoughtfulness that we bring to other parts of our lives. Um, and so that's something I think we can, we can individually work on. That's certainly something that I have tried to work on. But I think we face an immense stumbling block, um, and that's the sort of second, the second reason why the internet currently does not make us better people, more empathetic, more connected, and that's because the internet that we currently have is one that's driven by profit. So I interviewed a number of experts and read a number of books, and um, you know our our algorithms right now are sort of um, right now they are agnostic, is what people say about um, about the kind of the the content itself. What they care about is whether or not the content keeps us engaged. And it's easier to drive engagement with um, inflammatory content. And so until we have an internet that's not driven by the demands of profit, that's not set up to make these companies, um, Facebook, Twitter, to make them money, um, we're not going to be able to harness the internet's ability to make us better, fuller selves. But that doesn't mean that the internet can't do that. That doesn't mean that we can't harness the internet's ability to become more fully ourselves. It just means that we have to see immense systemic change happen. And in the meantime, I think we can sort of work to, within this sort of, you know, very imperfect system to try and have the best kind of experience that we, we can.